Demons! <laughs> ah, what a controversial topic. Some people fully believe in them, and some others believe that you have to be completely insane to do so. As somebody who used to identify strongly with atheism, I used to belong to that second group. And even though that has changed over time, my logical and scientific mindset has never left me, and that's why I decided to make this video. I would like to welcome every scientist, every skeptic, every atheist to listen to today's topic because I was and in many ways continue to be one of you. And this is your chance to learn about demons by somebody who really understands what it feels like to discuss such faith-based topics with such intense skepticism. My intention today is to remove all need for faith or belief and to talk to you in the same way in which I would have talked to an older version of myself. I will use tangible ways of discussing this topic in a way that no matter what your belief system or background is, you will be able to understand them and to feel their presence inside and outside of you. So let's do this. Hi there, I'm Ivan with a decade of experience facilitating healing ceremonies. During this time, I got exposed to thousands of people's traumas and healing processes. Now, the topic of demons is not something that I was interested in, as I didn't believe in them in the same way in which religious people talk about them, and I always approach spirituality and healing from a more grounded place using the perspective of psychology. However, with time and a different set of experiences, I started noticing that almost every part of reality can be seen and interpreted both from a more science-based worldview as well as a spiritual one, and that both can be true at the same time even though that might sound somewhat contradictory. That is based in the theory that science and spirit are simply worldviews, or better said, lenses or filters through which we experience the world. I made a complete video just on that topic, which you can check out by clicking here in the corner or down in the description below. I do recommend you to check that one out first, as it will give you a lot of context for today's topic. So thanks to this perspective that science and spirit are just lenses or filters through which we experience the world, I thought, if demons are what we experience when we see the world through the lens of spirituality, what is it that we experience when we look at the same thing but through the lens of science? Asking myself that question, in combination with a really powerful story that I'd like to share with you later, made me come up with a much better understanding of what demons are and how they can be explained in a way that everyone, including atheists and scientists, can not only understand them, but also even feel them all by themselves without the need to use belief. So today we are going to talk about what they are, how they work, how, why, and when they show up. What do they attach to? Which types of them are out there? How do spiritual people approach them? How they relate to science and psychology? Why is it important to talk about them in these terms? A powerful story that changed my perception of them and another way of looking at them as the cause and not the effect. Are you ready? So first, what is a demon? Let's start by naming what a demon is not, just to be clear and to try to get everybody on the same page. A demon is not a little red devil with horns and a trident speaking directly into your ear, trying to convince you to cheat on your girlfriend, while an angel whispers on the other ear, trying to convince you not to. And even though these are fun ways in which cartoons depict them, once we start talking about them, you might start feeling that they didn't get it completely wrong either. Hopefully by saying this, I can already start getting some of you skeptics on board. So, what is a demon? A demon is nothing else than a force. That's it. It sounds very simple. And it is. We will talk about which kind of force. But in order to make this easier to understand, we first need to remember that we are already exposed to invisible forces that we all agree about their existence and that we even have mathematical equations for them. The magnetic force is one of them. You cannot see the force itself, but you can see its effects when you look at your little Eiffel Tower magnet not falling off your fridge, or at the needle always facing north in a compass being attracted by the Earth's magnetic field. You are also familiarized with another invisible force, gravity, always pulling you down toward the Earth the same force that interrupted the most famous nap in history. What about nuclear force? The invisible force that keeps protons and neutrons bind together in the nucleus of an atom. Or the electromagnetic force, the frictional force, the centripetal force. You get the point. So, do we all agree about the existence of invisible forces that we cannot see, but that we know they are there because we can experience them? This is very important to be able to discuss demons. 
Now, because this word is already so charged with all the religious context and the ungrounded spiritual talk we hear often, I would like to remove the word demon altogether and let's for now simply call it a force. What kind of force? In this video, I will approach this topic mainly, but not only, through the psychological aspect. So when I ask what kind of force, we can say it is a psychological force. So here is my definition. It is a force that makes us act in ways that go against our own well-being. That's it. It's very simple. You don't need faith or spirituality to feel these forces. So let's talk about how these forces act and how they came to be there. Let's start with an example. Sometimes we do things that we know that we're going to regret. Now, let's think about that for a minute. We know we're going to regret it, and we do it anyway. Why would anyone do that? Theoretically makes no sense, right? There is something, whatever that is, that is driving us to make decisions that are going against our well-being. Forget about demons for a minute. Can you feel that force? Can you feel that without it, you would never choose to do something that you know that you will regret? Something is pulling us in that direction. We cannot see it, but like with gravity pulling us downward, this force is pulling us against ourselves. Yeah, and I know some of you might be thinking, well, there is no force doing that. It's just you acting from your own wounding or pain. Well, if you're thinking that, guess what? You're completely right. When we do something that we know goes against our own well-being, we are acting from wounding or pain. But who said that because that is true, there is no force? If we agree that when we act from a place of pain, we can do things that go against ourselves, could it be then that we aren't necessarily deciding whether we are acting like that because of a force or because of our wounding, but that that force is a consequence of our wounding? Now, going back to the example of gravity, if the Earth wouldn't be there, gravity wouldn't be there either. And the bigger the Earth, the stronger the force of gravity. In the same way, the force that makes us act in ways that go against our own well-being wouldn't be there without the wound. And the bigger the wound, the stronger the force. The force of gravity is correlated to the mass of the Earth. In the same way, the force that pulls us against ourselves is correlated to the depth of the wound. This analogy works really well to understand this. For example, we can see the Earth and we can feel the force of gravity even though we cannot see it. Analog to this, we can see the wound by remembering what happened in the traumatic experience, for example, and we can feel the force that pulls us against ourselves, but we cannot see it. The reason why I can say with such certainty that it is a force is because without it, whatever that is, we would never act against our own well-being. It would simply just make no sense. There is something making us do that. So of course wounding is essential for the existence of these forces. The wounding comes first and the force comes later. Is it like this? Hmm, I'm going to challenge myself, but I'm going to do it a little bit later. Let's for now say that yes, it is like that. When you do something that you know you're going to regret, there is a little battle going inside each person. One that goes completely under the radar for most people. But if you stop for a second to feel into it, you will notice that the battle is very real. It is a battle between the part of you that knows what the right thing to do is, which is the one that takes you toward your well-being, and a force pulling you in the opposite direction. Now, that force is what I call a demon. Now, you don't like that word? That's totally fine. Call it whatever you want. I, for a very long time, have been calling it force that goes against my well-being, but that's kind of long. The resistance of calling it a demon comes mainly from the religious charge this word has. I myself was extremely resistant to call it this way, so I get it. So why use the word demon then? Well, after spending years dealing with these forces, it started feeling right to call them like that because they feel dark and it feels to me that because of the existence of these forces that makes us act against ourselves, the world is the way it is in all of the ways in which we wish it would be different. Wars, cheating on someone, suicide, lying, stealing, hurting yourself on purpose, mistreating your children are, among a thousand other examples, things that we do that hurt ourselves and others. Yes, you can't hurt yourself without hurting someone else, and you cannot hurt someone else without hurting yourself. So even though my definition of a demon is that it's a force that goes against our own well-being, the overall effect is that it goes against the well-being of the world. 
the world is darker and harder to live in for all of us because of how much we hurt ourselves and others. We wouldn't do that without a force pulling us in the direction to do those things. The nature of the force of gravity is to pull you closer to the massive object. The nature of the forces we're talking about is to get in between you and a higher version of yourself, the part of you that would do the right thing and that actually does the right thing in those places in which you have no wounds or in which those wounds have healed. I call these forces demons because the combination of these three things seem to me that is the definition of demonic. How many times have you heard people say, I'm battling my own demons in a completely non-religious context? What people usually mean when they say that is, I am dealing with my awful thoughts, my stupid decisions, the misery I created for myself, etc. So even though they might not be aware of this, what they are truly saying is, I am battling with forces within me that made me act against ourselves and that as a consequence had those thoughts, those decisions and that misery. So let's explore the mechanics of demons. In order to understand how demons get in us or how we start going against ourselves, it would be really useful to understand how wounds work. And I also made a video dedicated to that specific topic, which you can check up here or also down in the description below. However, let's do a quick recap for those of you who have not seen that yet, though I highly recommend it. Trauma is an experience where your emotional needs go unmet. For example, your mom never touched you to express her love. The unmet need is to feel loved through physical touch. And there are other many ways in which we can feel love, and those are also needs that can go met or unmet. This traumatic experience makes this part separate from the self waiting in the sidelines until the need will be met. Why does this happen? Because this part of you, like all of the other parts, is always asking for its needs to be met. And if what it needs is unavailable, it is too painful to keep asking for something that won't come. So as a protective mechanism, it disconnects and separates from the self. Basically, it goes offline, hoping to one day have the need met. In the meantime, this leaves an empty space in your emotional body. Now, what is the emotional body? It's the part of you that holds your emotions. This empty space is called a wound. So, what is a wound? It is an empty space. That's it. Now, since this is an empty space, it wants to be filled with something. If it's filled with the unmet need, then the wound heals. But since that isn't available, otherwise the wound wouldn't be there to start with, it wants to be filled with whatever is available that is as close as the original need. In our example, the original need is to feel loved by my mother's touch. But maybe what's available or the closest similar thing is to feel loved by the touch of a mother figure. So I will start unconsciously seeking for that touch more than anything because it was missing from my needs. This can lead to being attracted to women that somehow remind me of my mother as I am unconsciously seeking for my mother's love through touch. Now when I find this woman, my need might be so strong that I might completely ignore all the red flags that are showing up that are telling me that this is not the right person for me. I will ignore that because I don't care and I don't care because I only care for that thing that I didn't get. Now when I say I ignore that this person isn't the right person for me. If you think about it, why would I do that? Why would I ignore that this is not the right person for me? What am I really saying? What I'm really saying is, I am acting in a way that goes against my own well-being. Can you start seeing how wounds and demons are so correlated? The wound is an empty space that pulls us in that direction in the same way in which a vacuum, which is an empty space, pulls matter onto itself. That force, that pull, that's the demon. We can say that the wound is like the demon's house. That force lives inside the wound. Cool, right? Now imagine that all of this is happening completely under your awareness. If you don't understand how you're traumatized, then you also don't understand which wounds you have, which also means that you don't understand which forces you have inside you that make you act in ways that go against your own well-being. Wouldn't you want to know? Because if we would know, then we would see with clarity where our patterns are coming from, why we are attracted to the people we are attracted to, why we sometimes do things we will regret, why sometimes we have thoughts that don't feel like they are our own, and we could see where all of this is coming from and thus know exactly where to focus our healing. Why is it important to heal? Well, in the example we were talking about, 
If I would heal my wound around my mom not expressing her love through touch, then I would have noticed that this new woman wasn't the right person for me because I would have been focusing on her as a whole and not only in if she can give me the touch that I didn't get. And so I wouldn't have to go through the experience of as long as someone similar to my mom expresses love through touch, then I don't care about anything else and therefore save me a lot of pain that comes with being with the wrong person. Now, demons are there for a great reason and they are not necessarily your enemies. They are there to soothe a part of you that was in a lot of pain when the original need was not met. They are there to attract the closest similar thing that's available so that at least you can get that even if that is not the original need. Because of those forces, we get to experience moments of temporary satisfaction in places where we are empty. You know what? Demons are like food that is not nutritious in moments of intense hunger. It might not be the food that you need, but at least it helps you keep going and not feel hungry for a little bit. In a way, they're kind of like friends. They keep you seeking for that thing that will keep you satisfied for as long as you don't get the thing that you really need. And that is not only important, but essential. It is like that food that helped you survive when there was nothing else. Demons are in a way that thing that helped us emotionally survive in moments of intense emotional hunger. However, everyone reaches a point in their life where they are not the same person but the younger version of themselves that got wounded and therefore allowed that force into their empty emotional space. What this means is that the child that got wounded is not the same person as the adult. Why is that? Well, the adult probably does not live in the same house with the same people, is probably not in the same situation, has lived through a lot more than the child and therefore acquired more wisdom and experience, maybe has done some healing, or they might be getting ready to start their healing journey. What this means is that this demon is an expression of a past that is not present anymore. The demon lives within the pain that child received in that specific situation, not the pain that the adult received. This means that the demon today lives within your inner wounded child that lives within you. And this means that this demon is not useful to you at this point. It is not your friend anymore, and it needs to live. And there is only one way to expel a demon out of oneself, which is by filling the empty space where the demon lives with the original need that went unmet. By doing that, you are taking away its home. It is like bringing back the original owners of a home after they have left for many years, kicking out the squatters that took over. Now, expelling a demon is a definition of exorcism. So we can define exorcism as a removal of a force that makes you act against your own well-being. Now think about this, if healing is done by meeting the original need and that fills up the empty emotional space where the demon is attached to, we can then say that an exorcism is the automatic consequence of healing. So in reality, we should never try to perform an exorcism. Instead, we could simply do real meaningful healing and the exorcism will happen for us. The word exorcism is also very charged with the religious context. However, an exorcism does not need to look like in the movies at all, and that's why people trying to perform a more traditional style exorcism tend to fail. Because even if somehow they manage to remove the demon in the moment, it tends to come back because real healing hasn't happened and so the empty emotional space is still there creating a vacuum. I tried a few times performing those and it kind of worked but soon thereafter, the demon comes back, and I always knew that that would be the case. If we know what the demon attaches to, then forcing them out or using magic won't really do much. Instead, let's simply remove their house by doing real healing. Do you know how most exorcisms look like? Just like this. Through sweet tears. Those tears are the consequence of your emotional body recovering a part of itself by meeting the real need those tears are the river flushing away the demon. This means this person will not be doing anything else that goes against their own well-being in the places in which healing has happened, but they will in which those places in which it has not yet. What this means is that we have a lot of wounds and so we have a lot of demons. What this also means is that we had a lot of friends caring for us as kids that are not our friends anymore that we need to expel by doing real healing. So how do we do real healing? Well, that video that I made that I was referencing before is where I explain in detail how wounding and healing work 
and how we can do self-healing all by ourselves without the need of anything or anyone. So I recommend you to check it out. These forces are everywhere and act in ways that are far beyond simply doing things that we know we are going to regret. They can show up in the form of awful thoughts or unconscious actions or intention to hurt. Sometimes I catch myself with certain negative kind of thinking and a part of me that feels much more like myself says, these are not your thoughts. This is not at all who you are. When we talked about free will, which by the way, you can check the video here, we said that we lose our free will in those places where our wounds decide for us. Why is that? Why do these wounds have this much power? Well, because these forces live inside those wounds. These wounds are their house. If there is a wound, there is a force living in there that will make you do whatever it takes to feed the wound rather than heal it. The more you start exploring the idea of demons being real and the more you open up to them, the more that you will start seeing them everywhere. They have been right in front of us and inside of us since ever, with most of us not even noticing how much they affect our everyday life. Acknowledging their existence is also a necessary part of healing, as there are some wounds that require that specific viewpoint to be addressed. So this covers the very basics on the topic of demons. If you have a more scientific way of looking at the world, hopefully this has made you a little bit more open to them, to understand them, and who knows, maybe even to feel them. With this video, I'm hoping to expose them so that everyone can start seeing them too. These forces like to hide because if we do not heal, then they survive. Hey, I'm recording this after the video was already finished, but I wanted to give you a little gift. It is a summary of everything that you just watched, nicely put together in a beautiful PDF so that you can take a look at it anytime that you need to refresh your memory. This will give you access to the PDF of this and all my other videos. The link is in the description below. We have a lot more to talk about around the topic of demons. We just covered the basics. However, I did not want this video to get too long. So stay tuned for part two to complete this video. As always, thank you for listening and for your attention. If you liked the video and would like to support the channel, clicking like and subscribe does exactly that. So I will see you next week for part two. Bye. Click on the left square to watch another video I made on a related topic. All my content is free. If you appreciate it and wish to assist me to continue releasing this kind of content, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You can also follow me on my socials and subscribe to this channel.